lessons, we will cover Genesis chapter 4 to 11. <clears throat> There's eight chapters. We had spent a lot of time earlier, just over three chapters, because those were foundational. But at this point, we will speed up. And for some of you, who may be better at listening, not very good readers, don't like to read too much, I would suggest at this point you start to learn to listen to your audio Bible. <clears throat> now, in these few chapters, we will see how evil and sin spread from the Garden of Eden, the fall of men, and how it spread throughout the whole world. <clears throat> How violence, immorality, corruption spread throughout the whole world. It became literally a global pandemic of such diseases, moral diseases. Now, this is a huge thing, I said, the whole world. Genesis chapter 1, 211, which is the end of today's study, covers a wider span of time than the rest of the entire Bible. This is less than 1% of the Bible. Covers more time than the entire rest of the Bible and more countries than the entire 99% of the rest of the Bible. Because at this point, we are looking at the world and from creation until how sin spread. After this, Genesis 12, this focus is much smaller. First on one man and his family, Abraham. Then later on, on one nation, Israel. And later on, on one group of people, the church, Ecclesia. So the focus, worldwide focus, becomes a very narrow focus. So today we're going to go very, covering lots of time. Now, how does God teach us about what happened through various characters? So we're going to study a few characters today. The first one that pops up in Genesis 4 is Cain, the eldest son of Adam. It says, not much about him, but that it says that Cain brought a sacrifice of the field. He was a farmer while his younger brother, Abel, brought the sacrifice of the flock, possibly a sheep. And interestingly, he not only brought the animal, but he brought the animal as a sacrifice. Now you will say, how do you know that? Look at Genesis 4, verse 4, and you, say, and you will see, Abel brought of the firstlings, the best of his flock, and of the fat of it. Now, when you bring an animal, obviously, if it's alive, the whole animal comes, huh? the, the, the lean meat, the fat, all comes together. But it says he brought the firstlings and of the fat of it, which means that the animal had already been chopped up into its pieces and different parts separated. The fat was also brought along. So in other words, Abel performed what is first the first animal sacrifice, voluntary sacrifice in the world. Earlier on in Genesis, remember God had killed an animal to give the skin to cover Adam and to cover Eve. But now Abel did it, not God. God didn't kill the animal. Abel did it. Now how did Abel know what to do? I'm very sure his father must have told his sons. Cain and Abel, you know what God did for us? We tried to cover ourselves with fig leaves. It didn't work, but God killed an animal and made skins for us. And the only way we can approach God is through this animal that was killed and provided us a covering. So Abel then obeyed his father and also approached God with an animal that had been sacrificed. Cain refused to do that. And God said, and the Bible says, God was not pleased with Cain. And Cain was so angry. 
How come he's pleased with my younger brother? God is pleased with my younger brother. And in a fit of envy, he kills Abel. First murder in human history, all right? First an animal got killed in the Garden of Eden. Now a man gets killed just outside the garden. Now, what do we learn? We learn one important truth. Envy is a huge sin. Never forget that, all right? Now, many people cannot differentiate between envy and jealousy. Envy is, I'm very angry someone took what is mine. Someone takes my wife, I'm jealous. Of course, I have a right to be, so she's mine. Same when someone takes God's honor. God's jealous because God is the only one who should be honored, right? So, what is envy? Envy is I'm angry someone has something that I don't have. It's not mine, but he's got more than me, all right? So, envy is a sin. Jealousy is not a sin. God is a jealous God. And you should be jealous for your wife, jealous for your reputation, <clears throat> Because it's yours right now second truth we learn is sibling rivalry so first one be careful of envy it's always in our awful human nature second sibling rivalry and you see this repeated over and over again right be careful parents this is a sin that can affect this is a problem that affect your family Another truth we see here is God chose Abel was favored above his older brother. And you find that often. For example, Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Joseph over his brothers. Why does God do this? Because God wants us to know that we don't have a natural right to God. It's God's choice, right? We don't have a natural right. Many people think, oh, my, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a, my father is a pastor, so I should be a, the next pastor. There's no natural right. And that's a very common problem that automatically a pastor's kid thinks he has a natural right to claim his father's pastorate. <clears throat> All right, so these are some seed truths you can just ponder about. Now, the next character we see here in Genesis chapter 4 is a guy called Lamech, L-A-M-E-C-H, not well known. Now Lamech was the first, just a few generations after Adam, was the first man to take two wives and this is where polygamy began. Up to this point, I believe everybody knew God made his wife, uh, Adam's wife from his rib, he was to love her, cherish her, one, one man, one wife. Lamech took two. And from then on, polygamy became very, very common, affecting almost everybody, including the patriarchs, including the, the, the so, uh, David, Solomon, everybody. Women now, from now on, not was someone you cherish, but someone you own. It's like property. If I'm a rich guy, I'm a powerful guy, I can own more sheep, I can own, I get more wives. And so that became part of human culture. Almost every society has accepted that, that women are like men's property. Very sad, right? So, Lamech begins this. Now, you see Lamech had some kids. One of them was called Jubal, and he invented music. That's very nice. And he's find that music is in the heart of God, God's musical. Later, we'll find that out. And music is found in every culture, however primitive. In fact, the more primitive sometimes, the more music, and the more musical. And you find that J this guy called Jubal, the son of Lamech, invented two kinds of instruments. One was called the harp, that speaks of all stringed instruments. The other was called the organ or the pipe, windpipe. And you find almost all cultures, in fact, all cultures will have some form of a string instrument and a blowing instrument. But another interesting story is his another son called Tubal Cain. Tubal Cain invented metal work. And from then on, violence took a new height because almost all weapons become much more effective 
in metal. Up to today, almost all weapons are made of metal. Before that, they used stones and threw each other. For example, probably Cain killed Abel with a stone. But from this time on, Tubal Cain on, metal became used and violence escalated. We'll move on and learn more characters soon. Genesis chapter 5 begins with a genealogy. There are about 10 genealogies in Genesis. Names upon names. Sometimes you wonder why there are so many names. God wants you to know that He remembers every name. And we who are made in His image should try to remember names because we build relationships with people and people are identified by names. Many believers don't bother to learn people's names. How do you pray for them? How do you feel for someone you don't even know the name? God not only knows their names, He knows the ages you see in Genesis chapter 5. He knows every detail. Most of us don't even know the names of our grandparents, let alone their ages. But God remembers all these things. So what is the lesson here? The lesson is God remembers His amazing memory. And that is a comfort to us if we are His children. So we can be sure our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Many times we serve God and say, nobody appreciates me. Don't worry about that. Your labor is not in vain. God remembers everything you do in His name. Then we go on to see a character in Genesis uh, chapter 6, I believe, a person called Enoch. Now, Enoch is mentioned several times in the New Testament. He is said to have been a, he said to have prophesied, so he's a prophet. He prophesied judgment on his generation. You see, evil had come in, so much evil had come in, and God sends his man, Enoch, who prophesied that judgment would soon come. So we're going to see the preparation for the judgment called the flood. And Enoch was sent as a prophet. Before God sends judgment, God sends prophets to warn. That is God's way. You will see throughout the Bible. And our job as God's servants is basically to warn people of God's holiness and God's judgment. So he did this, and of course people hated him. Everybody was having polygamy and corruption and, and every kind of uh, immorality. And here comes this man to spoil their fun. And the Bible says something about Enoch. He walked with God, and then he was not for God took him up. It's very interesting. You see this in Genesis chapter 6. In other words, he was raptured. One of two people, Elijah in the Bible and Enoch, who was raptured. Why, was God, why did God take him up? I think people wanted to kill him. I mean, people hate someone who spoils their fun, who warns them of judgment. Now, Enoch after we see Enoch, we see another name, which is quite well known to many people, in, even in the secular realm, the name Methuselah. Methuselah is well known to mo many people as the man who lived the longest. You see, wow, you can be as old as Methuselah. Methuselah lived 969 years. Nobody broke that record ever. Now you say, 900 years, that's crazy. At that time, even Adam lived 930 years. People lived very long. I don't know why, but I believe that God allowed that. And as violence came up and wickedness came up, God had to put a limit on people's uh, age. Otherwise, you have so many wives if you live so long. You have, you have so many murders to your name if you live so long because of the evil, right? So God put a limit. That's number one that God diminish man's life. Some people try to explain it by science and say the early days there was this canopy over before the flood. 
that prevented, you know, the radiation from the sun that causes all kinds of mutations that cause death, etc. You can try to prove it any way you like. I'm not even uh, going to prove it or not prove it. But the point is this, that they live a long time. But Methuselah was the longest. Why? Because he had a very strange name. His name, Methuselah, means when he dies, it will come. What does that mean? His name was a prophecy that when he dies, the flood would come. So why did God prolong his life? God wanted to give people more time. God didn't want to bring this judgment. God has to judge, but God wants to have mercy, right? God is a merciful God. So you see this long life and finally the flood comes when he dies. Now, Methuselah is the grandfather of Noah. You know? And so, what we have is, when finally he dies, Noah had already built the ark and the flood came. Now, there's another interesting, in Genesis chapter 6, very interesting. It speaks of the sons of God saw the daughters of man, and they had children who became giants in the land. Now, this chapter has baffled Christians, baffled Bible scholars, and nobody knows exactly who these giants were. The word actually translated giants comes from a Hebrew word, Nephilim, N-E-P-H-I-L-I-M. Now, Nephilim, nobody knows the meaning. Does it mean a super powerful guy? Does it mean a half angel? Some people say the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, all right, speaks of angels who then saw women and had relationships with women and produced this strange breed, half angel, half man, who was so super powerful and it was called Nephilim. Some said no. The sons of God were those powerful guys, you know, people like uh, uh, who, who, who were apparently like the heroes of the day, and they had sibling, uh, children, offspring, that became very powerful. So nobody knows, all right? Whatever it is, there's no need to figure that out too much. Anyway, it tells us in Genesis ch ch uh, chapter 6, this terrible thing. Violence then became an immorality, and evil became rampant, and it says in Genesis 6.6, 6, something very interesting. It says that evil, <clears throat> wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of man was only evil continually. Genesis 6.6. 6. In other words, sin up to this point of time had been uh, events had been uh, sporadic, had been more and more frequent until now in Genesis chapter 6, it becomes continuous. It's a global pandemic. Everywhere, all the time. It's not like this. Sometimes there's an epidemic, an epidemic. No, it's a pandemic all the time. Just everywhere. Everybody's infected by all these sins. So, Genesis chapter 6, that's verse 5. Sorry, that was Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6. Horrible statement. It says, one of the saddest statements in the Bible, and it says, God regretted that he had made man. In the King James, it says, God repented. That sounds very odd, and it's not probably the right translation, right? But God regretted that he had made man. You know, it's like when a father says, you know, a father usually loves his kid however bad he is, but it reaches a point when the father just says, why did I ever have this son? Oh, that's a very sad statement. And shortly after this, the flood came. Why the flood? Evil was so bad, God had to clean up the world and reboot it again. We now come to the story of the flood. Everybody is 
knows the story. In fact, every culture has a story of a flood. Is this a fairy tale that cultures propagate? The Bible story is definitely not a fairy tale. Fairy tales are vague on details. They say once upon a time, long, long ago, far, far away, in such and such a never, never land. But the story of a flood gives specific details of the people, their genealogies, very specific dates, locations, everything detail. Now, fairy tales don't give details. Now, why was Noah chosen? The Bible says in Genesis, he was a righteous man. In the midst of all this horrible uh, evil, there was one righteous man. But in New Testament, it says something else about Noah. He is found in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is the, I would say, the hero's hall of faith. All the men of faith are in this hall. Uh, in this chapter, Noah is found in Hebrews 11, 7. And it says, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen as yet. What does this mean? See, Noah was warned of God about a coming rain and flood. Now, Noah had never seen rain. Up to this point, as I said earlier, the world had water below, water canopy up there, this mass of canopy of water up there, and the world was watered by this mist, like a hot house, beautiful, perfect growing environment. But the Bible tells us, God warned him, I'm going to bring rain and flood. And Noah probably said, what is rain? What is a flood? Right? So, Yet, when God told him to build the ark, he built it. That's faith. Never seen it. Told, just believed God. In the New Testament, it actually says, we all know Noah as a builder of an ark. But in the New Testament, it doesn't mention that at all. It says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, it says he was a preacher of righteousness. Wow, he's not known as a naval architect or a naval builder, but a preacher of righteousness. What was he doing during this time? Just building the ark? No, no, no. He was preaching to the people. You say, what do you mean? Imagine, huh? Noah's building this massive thing. It takes a very long time. People actually don't know how to calculate how long it takes. It varies from one year to many years. It doesn't matter. It takes a long time to build an ark in those days. All right, nobody uh, had the equipment and the massive structure. And these people came and said, what are you doing, Noah? And Noah said, I'm preparing for God's judgment. What? What are you talking about? And then he preached to them that God would judge the world because of their evil. He was a preacher of righteousness. So basically, the ark was his pulpit. The ark was a... A, like I would say, a, attraction to draw people. Can you imagine those like the Universal Studios or Disney of that time? Everybody said, have you been there? Have you seen this amazing structure? Everybody would come and see, what is this guy doing? And he just preach and preach. So it's probably the biggest pulpit, the longest sermon, all right, to the largest number of people in the world at that time. <clears throat> so, here we have God warning the people long time to build this ark and God used a preacher of righteousness. Okay, <clears throat> Now, there's several frequently asked questions, maybe about five about the ark. Number one is how is it possible to flood the whole world with um, rain, 40 days of rain, okay? It rains 40 days, you can't cover the whole world, right? Well, the Bible explains that very, very plainly. It says that the windows of heaven were broken. This huge canopy was now 
released, the water was released, like a dam, you know? When you open a dam, the floodgate, the water comes out not like rain, but a uh, 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 flood of water. Except this time the flood doesn't come from a dam this way, it comes from heaven this way. So imagine God punctures the dam at different places and water didn't come down by drops, it came down as a, a mass of water. Secondly, the Bible says the great fountains of the deep were broken up. We all know today there's a lot of water underground. Ask any farmer, he knows. No rain, deep, deep, deep wells will provide water. So there's a lot of water underground. In fact, scientists now say that subterranean water may be more than the water in the sea. So those were broken up too. So water comes out from here, water comes out from here and literally covers the ground, number one. Okay? Number two, how do you cover the whole earth? He said the whole earth was covered. You know how high Mount Everest is? 29,000 feet? <laughs> I have studied that in geography. Well, I, the geologists believe the world was much flatter at that time before the tectonic plates met each other and form mountains and valleys. The world was more round and less ups and downs. And so literally the world was easily covered at that time. There were not high peaks and deep valleys. All right, so that's question number two. Now, how do you put so many animals in the ark? Well, the size is given very, very clearly. The size is stated very clearly, 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. So it's a box like that, huh? shape of a box. If people have calculated using the cubit, using the measurement, that this size can hold 70 thousand animals of average size. I will explain that later, what I mean by average size, okay? But first, I want to, you to see the dimensions of this ark. It's very interesting. 300, 50 wide. 300 long, 50 wide. Six times longer than the width. Most modern ships have the same dimension, unless they're specially built ships, right? Normal ships six times longer in length than the width. Height, 300 long, 30 high. 10 times longer than the height. You can almost picture in your mind now. That's the size of, that's a modern naval architect's standard measurements for a boat, right? So imagine the other episodes of the flood, they were there are many stories of a flood. For example, the Babylonian story, the ark was a cube, a perfect cube. Imagine a cube in the water currents. It'll just spin round and round. You put a cube in the water, when there's a current, it just goes round and round. 150 days, the animals would be totally dizzy with a tiger, and so would be, so would Adam B, uh, Noah B, all right? So, obviously, the measurement was big enough for 70,000 animals. Now, next question. How come? Do you know how big Tyrannosaurus is? Or you say average size animal? Tyrannosaurus so big. Let me ask you another question. Do you know how small a baby Tyrannosaurus is? Why did Noah have to bring the giants in? you see seen dinosaur eggs? I've seen them in museums. They're big. When a dinosaur comes out, it's not that big. Right? The reason why dinosaurs grow that big, they live long. Reptiles don't have a cut-off growth time. Like us, 18, we stop growing. Reptiles just keep growing. So Tyrannosaurus lives long, gets huge. Crocodiles get huge. But a baby Tyrannos Tyrannosaurus is very small. Right? So no big deal on that. Okay? Of course dinosaurs can go in. Don't have to take the old fellows. Right? Next one. You know how many animals, types of animals there are? Just cattle alone, that 1,000 species. No, we're not talking about species, we're talking about genus, right? In science, there are families. Canine family, equine family for horses, bovine family for cattle. The genus 
of the bovine family. The genes in one papa and mama can produce wagyu beef, dairy cattle, all kinds of cattle, 1,000 species. But Noah didn't bring the species in, he brought the genus, he brought the original, the, the ones who could produce all kinds of species and subspecies, all right? So basically, when you come to genus, like canine, feline, equine, it's not that many. Lastly, how to have enough food. Let me teach you something about science and I think most of you know. All animals, 99, more, almost all, can hibernate. Hibernation, humans cannot hibernate. After a few hours, you have to get up. 20 hours sleep max. You've got to get up and walk. Animals have a ability to tune down their body, slower heart rate, slower breathing, and literally go to sleep and don't eat. Bears don't eat for 100 days, no problem. Snakes don't eat for one year, no problem. All animals can hibernate, so don't worry about the food issue. It's a non-issue. So I hope this helps you answer questions that you are going to hear from skeptics. <laughs> now let us see what happened after the flood. For 150 year, days, Noah and his family were in the ark with all the animals. After 150 days, they could come out. What does this signify? What is this a type of, this ark? You will notice the ark had three stories, very clearly stated. It was a box with three floors. And there was one door only to which all these thousands of animals went in. Again, remember, the tree is usually signifies God. One way to God. One door. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. After the flood, there, is, there are a few changes in the way God made rules for the world. Number one, at, there would now be, you just find this in Genesis chapter 9, the fear of man put into every animal. Before this, Noah and the animals, hello, hello, friends, pets, they were just pets of Noah, pets of Adam. Man and beast lived together. Tyrannosaurus and man were just buddies, not terrified of each other. But after this, every beast had the fear of man. Now we will know that you go into a forest, the moment the beasts smell men, they usually go away. They go away. Even the fiercest of all animals, like a lion or a tiger, when they smell men, they don't go for men. They go away from men. These beasts would only attack a man if they are cornered or if they are starving. <clears throat> Otherwise, they fear men. You go to a circus, you can see how a lion tamer can terrify 10 lions in his, in his cage. <clears throat> Second thing, it says that after this, animals now, no more your pets. They're your source of food. Before that, how do you kill your pet to eat? You can't. They're your friends. You don't kill your pet dog to eat. So all the animals were their pets. They didn't kill them. They ate vegetables. After this, meat was part of human diet. Not the original, but added on. Third thing, all this at the beginning of Genesis chapter 9, they were not allowed to eat blood. Up to today, Jews eat kosher food. When you hear of kosher, you say, what's that? We in Singapore are more familiar with the word halal. The Muslims eat halal food. Pretty similar. Kosher food, you have to slice and kill the animal in such a way that the blood is drained from the animal before the meat can be eaten. Right? So they usually cut around the jugular, let all the blood out first, and then the meat is eaten. 
right? For us in Singapore, many people, Chinese, actually take the blood and eat it, you know, but they, they can't do that, okay? Why? What's so special about blood? Just another source of food. Many Chinese will say it's quite nice, actually. <clears throat> I think God was going to teach us the sacredness of blood. Of course, we know medically, the life is in the blood, oxygen, right? No, no blood, no oxygen, no life. But it also speaks of the cross, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, which will cleanse us. Then after this, after these rules were given, we find Noah failed. You see, we thought, wow, we had cleaned out the world of bad people and Noah was chosen because he was righteous. But after that, he started to grow grapes, make wine and get drunk. So he was found drunk and found naked in his tent. Kind of disgraceful behavior. And so we see again that how, how humans just keep failing and failing, even this most righteous of men. Then after this, it tells us how the world was filled by the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? We know the J Shem is the father of the semantic tribe, semantic. Shem, S-H-E-M, take away the H, S-E-M, Semitic tribe, the Jews, okay? And people related to the Jews are from Shem. You can see the genealogy in uh, Genesis chapter 10. <clears throat> Japheth were the people mostly who migrated to what we call Europe. <clears throat> who is Ham? I always thought Ham were the Africans, okay, the black people. So my idea before was that basically Shem, the Browns, then Ham, the blacks, and Japheth, the whites. That was my idea of how these three uh, sons, descendants came out. But as I studied more, and I look at Genesis chapter 10, verse 17. There is a tribe called S-I-N-I-T-E, Sinite. All right? And as I started to look at it, I discovered they were, or they are believed to be, the ancestors of the Sino people. All right? And if you know... Sino is another word for China. So all of you who are Chinese, it's interesting. Genesis 10, 17 gives you your ancestor, Sinite, right? Now, many people believe that is true. The Koreans, the Japanese, the, the Chinese come from this race. So now, that blows my mind because this is a descendant of Ham. Ham is the black guy. We're not exactly black. So suddenly, after the genome, human genome project came out and discovered the human genes, we realized that skin color is a very tiny part of our genetic makeup. So that we used to think, right, all the people with brown were one gene structure, hair are uh, black, another structure, white. No. The gene, the color is such a minute part, it actually doesn't make much difference to the human uh, gene structure, right? Your gene content, so to speak. So basically, it's no more brown, black and white division. It's just different races. Now, if you ask me, for example, how come then? Well, if you get a, dark, a darker colored person, marrying a darker colored person, they get offspring that are probably darker and the offspring then marries another darker one you know and then after a while it's like how, how you make roses more red that's what people do just crisscrossing roses that are redder 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 the same rose but no change much in the genetic structure except one little gene the color gene is added all right so what i don't want to confuse you but basically all right this idea of skin color is something quite wicked to me because people will use skin color to be prejudiced against others. 
I'm white, I'm fair, so I rule over the dark, you know, and that's how colonialism became justified that the white race is superior to the black race or the brown race. I believe this is a wicked uh, theory, totally unfounded by genetics, especially now when we study genetics. It's got the color part of the genes is too tiny, but in the past, our thinking is color is everything. Color is the main factor in differentiating people. Today, it's a tiny factor. Okay, so here we have this story, and then finally we have Nimrod. It pops up, Nimrod's a mighty hunter, and the people, the races were supposed to scatter. Nimrod did the opposite. He discovered a technology that is still used today. He discovered how to make bricks. Now in the past, nobody knew how to make bricks, so nobody could make very big structures. But with bricks, Nimrod built a tower to reach the heaven. Nimrod wanted to be the emperor of Babel, of Babylon, and so that he would be like God on the earth. But God told them, scatter. Nimrod said, I'm going to gather them together around my tower and around me. And you know what God did? God gave them tongues. He confused their language. And people say, does God give tongues? I said, 100%. He did it at Babylon first, in Babel. Now, the moment they couldn't understand each other, they couldn't, Nimrod couldn't rule. How do you rule people who don't even understand a word you're saying? And people began to scatter through all the world. And so, we end this story by how people scattered through the earth, and then the end of Genesis 11 is a genealogy which then shows a name called Abram. Abram. And then the Bible moves on the next chapter to a totally new aspect of it. One man and his one family. Mm -hmm.